in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our Bible study tonight from Psalm 123. There are 15 Psalms from Psalm 120 to 134. These 15 Psalms they are called the Psalms of Ascents because they used to recite these Psalms while they were ascending the mountain to go to worship God in the temple. So Psalm 123 is the fourth Psalm from the Psalms of Ascents. So it is another in the series of psalms sung by pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem at feast time. The author is unknown and it is not thought to be written by David. Some think it was written by some other person in later times, especially when the people of God were exposed to men's scorn, hate, and contempt. So some people say it was written by one of the captives of the Babylonian captivity when the Jews were suffering by the Babylonians. And the reason for believing it was written during captivity is that the psalmist speaks in the language of the children in captivity, as we are going to see. Some also think that this psalm may be written when Nehemiah returned to Jerusalem in his first visit and saw the ruins of Jerusalem and how the temple was ruined and the walls of Jerusalem were destroyed. Because there was a report of the miserable state of the remnant of the returned exiles. And this made Nehemiah to go to Jerusalem. And he spoke repeatedly of the contempt and scorn with which the Samaritans and the heathen neighbors of the Jews viewed his effort for the restoration of the city and building the walls of Jerusalem. Also others think it was composed within the Maccabees period in the time of Antiochus, who magnified himself against God and against the people of God, and he profaned the sanctuary and took away the daily sacrifice. Others believe that it was written a little, just a little before the coming and the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ on behalf of those who were waiting for the Messiah, who were scorned, put down, and mocked by the proud scribes and Pharisees. So Psalm 123 is the fourth psalm of the Psalms of Ascents. And actually, it is the first psalm that all its verses are just a prayer. Because other psalms, it's not a prayer, it is just a communication. For example, Psalm 122, I was glad when they told me, let us go to the house of the Lord, my feet stood within the walls of Jerusalem. So it is just, it's not a prayer, but this psalm, it's four verses, but each verse is a prayer to God. So this prayer psalm is short, four verses, but powerful, and a very fit example to show the power of prayer. And the power of prayer is not depending on how long your prayer is, but on 
the fervency, the zeal, and the eagerness of the spirit. Also, this psalm is expression of the community lament. Not one person, but the whole community. And they pray to God because they trusted in God. And they are pleading with God to help them in the face of the scorn. Psalm 120 speaks about the person who was in a very far away land and surrounded by trouble and he is completely alone. But now, in Psalm 123, he may face persecution, but he's not alone. He does so along with the rest of God's people. He is not alone. In Psalm 120, he was alone. In Psalm 121, I lifted up my eyes to the mountains. So in Psalm 121, he lifted up his eyes to the hills, to the mountains. But now in Psalm 123, he is lifting up his eyes to the Lord himself. In Psalm 122, I was glad when they told me, let's go to the house of the Lord. He spoke about the thrones of the house of David. But in Psalm 123, he is actually, he left up his eyes to the throne of God himself in heaven. So in this psalm, as the pilgrims approach the earthly throne of God, here on earth, the temple in Jerusalem, they lift up their eyes to the Lord's heavenly throne and they pray for mercy, grace, favor, so that they can continue their journey into God's presence. In this psalm, the psalmist asks God for help because he, the psalmist, and his people have suffered contempt and scoffing. That's why this psalm is beautifully called the eye of hope. They lifted up their eyes to God in hope. This psalm encourages the oppressed and the persecuted ones to look to the Lord and to put themselves in the hands of God and to trust God to do what is the best for them. As I told you, this psalm is a short psalm for verses. The psalm actually, we pray it in the 11th hour of the Agbaya. Also, in the tradition of the church, after the person enters the church and prostrate in front of the altar, when he stands up, he prays Psalm 123. So, after we prostrate in front of the altar and we stand up, we pray Psalm 123. Verse 1 and 2, the afflicted looks to the Lord. Verse 3 and 4, the afflicted pleads for mercy. Verse 1, unto you I lift up my eyes, O you who dwell in the heavens. So the psalmist opens his prayer by deliberately, deliberately lifting his eyes above the earthly scene, above those other thrones, the thrones of David, they spoke about them in Psalm 122. And also, he is lifting up his eyes to God who is above the thrones of the earthly leaders who have shown contempt for God and his people. This means that his eyes are not on the circumstances. 
his eyes not on himself, but on the Lord. This reminds me of St. Stephen, when he looked up to heaven while they were stoning him. And when he found the heaven is opened, and he received great consolation, great comfort from heaven, that's why he said, don't charge them with this sin. So the lifting of eyes is a gesture of the lesser looking to the greater. It is a gesture of submission, reverence, and respect. It also expresses yearning and hopeful expectation. The uplifted eyes naturally and instinctively represent the state of heart, which fixes desire, hope, confidence, and expectation upon the Lord and the Lord only. So the psalmist here looked so high that he could look no higher because he's looking at the throne of God in heaven. He was not looking to the hills like in Psalm 121, but to the God of hills he looked in this psalm. So this verse is very expressive of the holy confidence in God and a comfortable hope of receiving good things from God. On contrary, when the person is ashamed and defeated with a sense of his sins and of his own unworthiness, almost out of all hope, this person cannot lift up his eyes to heaven or his face before God. Like the publican, he could not lift up his eyes, but he beat his chest and said, God have mercy upon me, a sinner. And actually God accepted his prayers and he went his home justified. Many people rush their prayers, but perhaps one can learn from this psalmist here to start by focusing on the one who dwells in heaven, to lift up our, our eyes to God who is in the heaven. Actually, this is how our Lord Jesus Christ told us to start our prayers. He told us, when you pray, say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Yes, we know God is everywhere. But it is natural to think of God as being above us in that glory in heaven, in that glorious place which lies beyond the skies. St. Augustine confirms that it is befitting of the believer to ascend through the Psalms of ascent as though on a ladder to God who dwells in the heaven who does not ascend, St. Augustine says, he who does not ascend by his heart will fall. That's why Psalm 120, the person was alone in a far country in trouble. Then in Psalm 121, he starts looking at the temple on the hill. And he started his journey until he arrived at Jerusalem and he was glad for the invitation and for the arrival, Psalm 122. In 123, he lifted his eyes up to God who dwells in heaven. St. John Chrysostom says, He is said to dwell in heaven, not as though confined by place. God is not confined only in heaven. Because God fills all things. So when he said, I left my eyes up to you who, who dwells in heaven, because God sits upon the cherubim, upon the powers in heaven. 
but also it was said about God that he is dwelling in human being. As we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16, I shall dwell in them and walk among them. And you are the temple of God and the Holy Spirit abiding in you. Verse 2, Behold, as the eyes of the servants look to the hand of their masters, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy on us. I want you to notice now in verse 2 he is speaking in plural, our eyes, mercy on us. Although in verse 1 he is speaking a singular, unto you I lift up my eyes. So while verse 1 is classified as an individual lament, the rest of the psalm classified as community lament because the psalm says our we instead of I. And the word eyes was mentioned one time in verse 1 and three times in verse 2 as the eyes of the servants, as the eyes of a maid, so our eyes look to the Lord our God. So he said, as the eyes of the servants look at the hand of their master. What does it mean looking at the hand of the master? Hands are instrument for doing, for making, for directing, for giving, or even for punishing. So look to the hand of the master means the psalmist here is saying that he and his community are looking for God's help because he will help them by his hands, for his guidance, give them direction, for his support, he may embrace them with his hands. Looking to the hand to direct them in their work, to point out unto them what they shall do, which is often done by a motion of a hand of the master. Go do this, don't do that. So the servant looks to the hand of his master for the slightest indication of need or want to instantly meet the need. So if the master by his hand, he met any uh, remark with his hands that he needs something, the servant will instantly meet the need of the master. With that same intensity, devotion, steadfastness, the psalmist looks to God. This is how people must approach God when they are seeking his mercy. They must not only look to the Lord as the king seated on his throne, but they must also look to the Lord as the servant look to their master. And commentators offered different interpretation of this verse. Some have supposed that the illusion here is to the fact that servant, when in danger, look to their master for protection. So if a servant in danger, he will look to the master to protect him. Or they look to the master to supply their needs. So as the servants of a household are dependent on the master of the household and look to him for the supply of their needs, so Israel acknowledges its dependence on God and look to God to relieve their present distress. Also, when the servant have been guilty of an offense, they look to the master for forgiveness and pardon. 
However, most of the commentators believe that the idea in verse 2 that they are looking to their masters with reverence and respect, that they attentively mark every expression of their will. So they are looking to the master in order to fulfill the will of the master. So the psalmist here is saying, as the servant or the maid look at the master or the mistress in the same way to do their will, to perform their will, we are looking at you, O God, in reverence and respect to do your will, thy will be done. And that we are ready to obey the commands of God on the slightest intimation of their wishes. So just if God revealed to us his will, we will do it. We are standing in a waiting posture with no will of our own. Thy will be done. God said to Abraham, go take your son, offer him as a sacrifice. Yes, Lord. And he took his son to offer him as a sacrifice. People must take the attitude of a servant toward the God. What does it mean to take the attitude of a servant toward the God? Means to be attentive to the will of God. Attentive to the will of God to execute it. Many times in our prayer we make the decision and we want God to execute my decision. God, I want you to do for me so and so. And if God did not do it, I'll be upset at him. It shouldn't be their way, this way. The servant doesn't tell the master what he should do. But the servant executes the will of the master, not the opposite. Not the master executes the will of the servant. That's why St. Paul, when he met the Lord on the road of Damascus, he told him this beautiful prayer. What do you want me to do? And every morning, we should start the morning by asking God, what do you want me to do today? So the servant in Psalm 123 has his eyes focused on his master, looking for the slightest gesture, the smallest wave of a finger to integrate the will of the master. So we learn from this psalm that God not only watches over us, but also we actually looking at him to execute his will. So our daily prayer should be like the prayer of St. Paul. Lord, what will you have us to do today? How we may serve you today, O Lord? We need to be attentive to his will. Also, looking at the master means to wait patiently for his timing, for the time of God. I'm here waiting for you to execute your will. Then he said, we are looking to God until he has mercy on us. We will keep looking to God until he has mercy on us. So, the psalmist does not demand from God immediate answer, but he will persevere patiently until God actually extend his mercy. Until God actually see the right time to execute his will. Then the servant will be responsive to the commandment of God. The servant watches and waits in order that he may do what their master commands. And does it mean when he said, until he has mercy on us, so once God has mercy on us, we'll not be looking at him, we'll take our eyes down? St. Augustine said on the word until, 
does that does not imply that believers will cease to look to the Lord after gaining the Lord's mercy. And there are many examples in the scripture that the word to tell means continuation. We will not cease after the, the, the verb after tell is, is executed. For example, he, Joseph, did not know Mary till she had brought forth her firstborn son, Jesus. But this doesn't mean after that he knew her. Another verse, the Lord said, Assuredly I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. It's about the wicked servant who did not forgive his brother. So even after he will pay the last penny, he will not get out of there because the punishment is eternal. But by the way, he will never be able to pay the last penny. Another example, for he, Jesus, must reign till he, the Father, has put all enemies under his feet, under the feet of Jesus. This doesn't mean and after the Father puts all the enemy under the feet of Jesus, then Jesus will not reign anymore. It doesn't mean this. In Genesis 8 verse 7, then he sent Noah sent out a raven, which kept going to and fro until the waters had dried up from the earth. This doesn't mean he stopped after that. So the psalmist has nothing to do but to wait for the Lord. He doesn't trust any other resource. And we ought to remember that we are the servant and God is the master. All of the creation is dependent on God and looks to him. As we read in Psalm 104, the earth is full of your positions. These all wait for you, that you may give them their food in due season. What you give them, they gather in. You open your hand, they are filled with good. So in this psalm, the servant looks to his master, knowing that the master will take care of him until he has mercy upon us. And we look to God as our master, knowing that he will take care of us. Many uh, prayers in the church, many litanies, start with our Lord God and Master, or Master, Lord Jesus Christ. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, gives an idea about how God is taking care of us. And may God shall supply all your need according to his riches, in glory by Christ Jesus. Verse 3, Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on us, for we are exceedingly filled with contempt. That's why I told you, most probably it was written in captivity. Verse 1 and 2 suggest a covenant relationship between this community and God, the heavenly king. So this covenant relationship is the basis for the plea in verse 3. The trouble that the praying community bring for the divine king is the contempt or scorn they face who are exceedingly felt with contempt. The psalmist is being mocked, persecuted for his faith in God. And so in desperation, he cries out to the Lord for mercy. Have mercy upon us, O God, and have mercy upon us. The supplicants are represented as standing and urging this petition, feeling that help could come only from God. That's why they are looking only for him and watching his countenance as servants do to their masters. 
and he demonstrated to us that waiting on the Lord is not a passive thing. It is not a passive thing. And he repeated the request for mercy, showing the intensity of his plea. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on us. He's repeating it. The psalmist needed God's intervention and mercy because he felt that he is filled with contempt put on him by others. According to St. John Chrysostom, their supplication to God to save them from such tough condition, it is for the sake of his mercies and not for the worthiness on their part. They are not saying we are, mercy, we are worthy, so deliver us from this contempt. No, they are saying we are relying on your mercy. We are asking because we know you are a merciful God. We know we are not worthy. We don't deserve it. But according to your mercy, O Lord, and not according to our deeds. And he said we are exceedingly felt with contempt. And the Hebrew word, uh, the word that translated felt here, means we are saturated. We are entirely full. Contempt has been shown them in every possible way and they are thoroughly despised that they could experience no more contempt. These pilgrims have endured contempt, ridicule, scorn from those who look down on them and they have simply had enough. But what is beautiful about these pilgrims, instead of fighting back and repaying contempt with contempt, no, they didn't do this, but they looked to their king to have mercy on them. St. Augustine says, all that will live piously according to Christ must need suffer reproof. We will suffer. All those who want to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Must need be despised by those who do not choose to live piously. All whose happiness is earthly. So the earthly people will despise the children of God. Verse 4, the last verse. Our soul is exceedingly filled with the scorn of those who are at ease, those who have it easy here on earth, and with contempt of the proud. So verse 4 states the nature and the source of contempt which they were called to bear and endure. These muckers are identified as at ease and proud or arrogant. This scorn is never easy to bear, but it is especially painful when it comes from those who seem to be at ease, who seem to have few problems or no difficulties in life. Those who are at ease are those who live in careless, confident security. Regardless of the judgment of God, and they don't pay any regard of the suffering of men, they are living easy life here. And the proud, they trample on God's people, thinking they magnify themselves by belittling others. Also, the proud may mean those who are proud of their natural abilities, of their wealth and riches, of their power, of their honors and high places, prestige. They don't look up to the heavenly king, but they look down to themselves and what they have and look down upon those around them. The arrogant look only to themselves, not to the master and certainly not to the heavenly king. The pilgrim community look, on the other hand, to the heavenly king for a word of mercy and grace. 
And this word of mercy and grace is absent from their current world because they are dealing with proud, arrogant, and people at ease. This psalm is filled with unspoken confidence that the mercy of God will triumph over the contempt of the proud. Contempt actually for the children of God can be regarded as honor, as we read in Acts chapter 5, verse 41, about the apostles. They departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name, for the name of God. So Psalm 123 can fit a variety of circumstances in both the ancient world and the contemporary world. And it is adaptable to our life. St. John Chrysostom says, don't panic if temptation comes. Rather, recall the words of the inspired author. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes, Psalm 119. St. John Chrysostom continues, accept the disaster as a medicine. Use temptation probably, properly, and you will succeed in attaining great, greater relief. This son is a cry of a person who has nothing left to do but prayers. All the doors are closed. Now, the only door that's open before him is the door of prayer. And according to St. Augustine, the word scorn and contempt are the same. And the word at ease and proud also at the same, at the same. Because those who lean upon the riches in haughtiness and pride scorn those who trust in the promise of eternal life by the Lord Jesus Christ. On account of that, it is not perceivable in the present time. This, at ease, they want to see and perceive something here on earth. Don't tell me about eternal life. I'm relying on the riches, on the wealth of the world. But the true Christian, even though he may be rich and wealthy here on earth, but also he consider himself poor. Why? Because he anticipate the heavenly riches that in no way can be comparable to the riches on earth. And he's anticipating the wealth in, in heaven. And they don't boast, actually, when they possess any earthly wealth here on earth. The true Christian count what he has as not his, regardless how wealthy he is. He knows one day he will go to heaven and leave everything. He knows that he is just a steward on what is the Lord's. At the same time, the true Christian feels that he is rich, for he needs nothing, nor covet anything. When we have contentment, that's the true richness. A person who is content is a truly rich person, because he feels he, he needs nothing. And he doesn't covet anything. Let me conclude by what St. Ambrose says here and relates it to the work of God that reaches us through the Lord Jesus Christ. It's beautiful. Christ is everything for us. If you wish to cure a wound, he is a doctor. If you burn with fever, he is a fountain. If you are oppressed by iniquity, he is justice. If you are in need of help, he is his strength. If you fear death, he is life. If you desire heaven, he is the way. If you flee from darkness, he is light. If you seek food, he is nourishment. This actually concludes Psalm 123. Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.